The last case on the calendar is Andrews v. City of Henderson. It's case number 20-17053. Council, if you're ready to proceed, we are ready to hear your argument. Good morning, Your Honor. May it please the Court, my name is Michael O. I represent the appellants, the City of Henderson, Philip Watford, and Carl Lippisch. And I'd like to, with the permission of the Court, request a reservation of three minutes of my time for any rebuttal. Just watch the clock. Thank you. Today I'm going to highlight three points for the purposes of this appeal. First, the District Court's denial of qualified immunity should be reversed because the circumstances of the Blankenhorn v. City of Orange case relied on by the District Court are materially different and cannot be applied to the instant case. Second, the existing case law at the time of this incident in 2017 was not clearly established and that the use of a tackle to take a person to custody was unconstitutional. And third, the denial of summary judgment as to the ratification claim against the City of Henderson was denied in error because when we're talking about qualified immunity and the existing precedent, the City of Henderson cannot be held to ratify a practice that has not been clearly established. So the crux of this appeal is really going to be about the denial of qualified immunity by the Court. While this Court has said that there does not need to be a case directly on point, the precedent must place the lawfulness of the particular action beyond debate. To my first point, the circumstances in this case are materially different than in Blankenhorn and cannot be applied to the circumstances in this instant case because the government's interest in this case were significantly higher in two respects. One, the severity of the crimes were not the same, and two, there was a threat to the safety of the public in this particular case. This distinction is material. How is there a threat to the safety of the public? Your Honor, in this particular case, the detectives were following Mr. Andrews in their plain clothes and there's undisputed evidence in the record that the detectives lost sight of Andrews momentarily during their surveillance prior to taking Andrews into custody. And it is because of that, the fact that they lost sight of him and the fact that they finally realized from the point that he entered the courthouse, but they had lost sight of Andrews while he was in the courthouse, that was a point in time when they realized they had probable cause that was confirmed by the lead detective in the case who was at the station looking up the information to confirm the identity of the individual. I'm trying to get to public harm, public safety. You've just been through it and your time is ticking, so I want to try to get to my point. I understand that he was wanted for a much more serious offense than was the defendant in Blankenhorn. I understand that. But this individual had just come out or passed through a metal detector. So there wasn't, is it your position that there was a realistic possibility that he was armed? Well, it's not to the point that he was armed, but remember we're dealing with someone who has committed five dangerous felonies. And I'm going to get to the point about the dangerous felony and why that's significant. But because there's a heightened government interest with someone who's committed an armed robbery, there's a lot more at stake for this individual. The detectives, because they lost sight of him, had to make a really quick decision to take him into custody, keeping in mind they're at a crowded public venue, which is the courthouse, and this was at 2 o'clock in the afternoon or maybe a little toward 3 o'clock in the afternoon, where there was a lot of people attending court. So when the detectives finally made contact with him, they had to make a really quick decision to take him into custody, keeping in mind the general public of the safety and without. I'm not sure I follow that argument. He's just coming out of the courthouse and it's in the middle of the day. You would agree with me that the record doesn't show he was doing anything to threaten the officers or the public or anyone at the moment they saw him, right? Correct, Your Honor, but it goes to the fact that he was suspected of five armed robberies. I know that we have that issue to deal with, but I'm just trying to figure out, I think like Judge Christin, in that moment, what's going on other than the fact that he's suspected of a violent crime? What else tells us that? Because I guess what I'm not understanding is it seemed like your argument was, well, they lost sight of him and they have to act right this second. Well, he's on his way out of the courthouse, not in it, not on his way in the courthouse. Why can't they follow him? Why can't they say, you know, please stop, you know, we're officers, you're under arrest. Why can't they do any of those things instead of just jump on him? 
But that'll be looking at the case from a 2020 hindsight of the officers. I mean, in this particular case, the officers lost sight of him. They knew he had been, he committed five armed robberies. And at that point in time, they knew they were in a crowded public ven venue. And as soon as they make contact, the next thing they know, they have to take him into custody because they have this concern for the general counsel, public counsel, safety. No one's, forgive me for interrupting, no one's disputing that they have reason to take him into custody. The question is, how are they going to do it? How are they going to? And that's what, that's the point you're missing. Judge Forrest and I are both trying to call your attention to that. As opposed to announcing themselves or, you know, why just jump on him? That's the point. Yeah, and I think the district court and their order kind of made those those kinds of uh, asked those types of questions. And I think those are potentially fair questions. But when we're talking about uh, the fact that the officers have to make this determination because we're in a crowded public venue, um, the officers made that determination because they knew he was suspect a suspect of five armed robberies. Weren't they trailing uh, him before he went into the courthouse? They were trailing him, and this is kind of interesting because they initially were trailing the person he was with, um, and then she picked Andrews up at a different location. Then they followed um, them, which ultimately ended in the courthouse. It was only up until the point where they lost sight of Andrews, and he was in the courthouse, if we're assuming the facts in light of favorable of the plaintiff, that probable cause was confirmed by the lead detective who was... Um, at the main station and communicated that information to the other undercover detectives that were following him. They pretty much, it, it sounds like, oh, forgive me, go ahead. I was going to say, they pretty much knew that he didn't have any weapon on him, right? He come through the, the device inside, the magnetometer or whatever it was. Well, assuming the facts in the light favorable to the plaintiff, it, and he did go through the scanners, the detectives still were caught off surprise and still had to make that quick <clears throat> determination and, and, and issue uh, or decision to take him into custody, keeping in mind that they were in a very crowded public venue. Sounds like your so argument is that even if they were wrong, they weren't unreasonable in choosing to arrest him in the manner they did. Is that your argument? Well, actually, Your Honor, um, let me kind of sidetrack you maybe uh, as far as, as far as the unreasonable the, the use of force and the justification for it. I think what the point is, is that in this particular appeal, we're looking at whether or not they're, they should be granted qualified immunity. I know the district court went through the analysis to determine whether or not this was an excessive use of force. But for purposes of this appeal, the reliance on the Blankenhorn case it is, is not the right case to be used, and it's materially different than this particular case because of the severity of the crime that has been deemed to be a uh, dangerous and, or a serious felony. And because of that, the government interest is heightened that would justify this type of force used, which was a tackle. And this court has held um, that a tackle is a minimal use of force. And that was in Jackson versus City of Bremerton, where that individual was taken down and tackled and um, by three officers. And the court held in that particular case that that was a reasonable use of force. So the point is, is that the officers um, realized that this was a serious felony. And Blankenhorn did not take that into consideration because that case had to do with a misdemeanor crime um, where the person uh, was suspected of committing at best a trespass at the, the mall. In this particular Counsel, case, it, it seems to me that the reason the, the crime um, that he's wanted for matters is to assess the most important gram factor, which is, is there a danger to the officers or to the public? And, and the problem you've got, it seems to me, is the blank horn view. Misdemeanor, certainly a less serious offense than the, the crimes for which this person was wanted. But he had just come through a metal detector. So as Judge Seiler noted, they had a pretty good idea he was not armed. That's the problem with that. Right. And that goes to the, obviously, to the analysis of whether or not this was an excessive use of force. But as it pertains to the issue of qualified immunity, immunity Blankenhorn was not the right case to use because the facts are so dissimilar that we cannot apply those facts, the facts in Blankenhorn to the facts and circumstances that these officers faced in this particular case. Well, the only fact and I like counsel, counsel, the only fact you've identified that's different in Blankenhorn and this case is what the person was suspected of. 
Is there some other distinction you want to make? Well, I was also going to uh, mention that there's a heightened, uh, as mentioned earlier, a heightened uh, government interest in the threat of the safety of the public, being that they're in a crowded public venue and that they had lost sight of him. But more importantly, when we're talking about the um, qualified immunity analysis, it's looking at whether or not the state of the case was clearly established at this time in 2017 when the officers arrested uh, Andrews um, for a for five armed robberies. Oh, so um, I'm going to follow up on that because um, you're right that that is the analysis that we have to apply. So Blankenhorn is out there and established law at the time of this event. And then we had also as a circuit said that just because someone's suspected of a felony doesn't give officers the right to do whatever they want in terms of force. They still have to act reasonably. So um, so with those things clearly established, how is it that you get around? I, I, I mean, I, I guess we're st we keep coming back to the only distinction you're pointing to between this case and Blankenhorn is what he was suspected of. And I have, I'm, I'm not sure that gets you there because we have said just because you're suspected of a felony doesn't mean that you can do whatever. That, that's correct, Your Honor. And that goes towards determining whether or not the force was excessive. But we're trying to determine whether or not, one, the, the case law was clearly established. And, and that's the point of this entire appeal is that the case law was not clearly established to put the officers on, on clear notice that using a tackle was uh, an unconstitutional use of force. Um, well, I think it was, that, counsel, that, counsel. That's what we're postulating. It, it, he's not fleeing. He's not armed. He's not representing, you know, danger to the public. Or that, that's opposing counsel's argument. This is your opportunity to respond to that. Right. Yes, and, and I'll point to um, two post Blankenhorn cases where this court held that the case law was not clearly established, and that would be uh, Satrum v. Voigt, um, which was in 2017, and the the, that involved uh, two officers uh, using force. I'm sorry. But not, that not a tackle. That, that, that individual there couldn't even recall how he had been arrested. Right? So that's really quite different. I believe that you're referring to the Santos v. Gates case, Your Honor. Um, oh, forgive me. It's cited in Satrum. It's cited in. You're, you're exactly right. Thank you. For it is cited me. in Satrum. You're correct on that. Yes. But Santos, they forgot, he forgot about that case. But they did rely on that case to make that determination that the case law was not clearly established. And the same thing in Bartlett v. Nieves, which was in 2016. And that case is really more akin to the situation here where we have two officers uh, where they tried to characterize that as a gang tackle, but said that it was just a tackle or takedown of that individual. Um, and in that case, there was no injury. But again, they were at a crowded public venue and that justified the force as being reasonable. So all, of the, all of the cases you're mentioning are distinguishable. One of them, a woman is interfering with the police who are trying to effectuate arrest of her son, right? Correct, and that's the Jackson v. City of Bremerton. But that's exactly the point because all of the facts and circumstances are different, yet there's an inconsistent body of case law that suggests that the right was clearly established that you cannot use a tackle to take someone into custody. And the distinguishing factor between this case and the Blankenhorn case that was relied on by the court is the fact that the severity of the crime heightened the government's interest uh, and to justify this type of force, which is a tackle, and this court has held in city of uh, Jackson versus city of Bremerton was a minimal uh, use of force. Would you like to reserve some time? I would, yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay, let's hear from opposing counsel, please. Good morning. This is Peter Goldstein. Uh, hopefully, you can hear me. I can hear you. Thank okay. you. Please, the court. Uh, the Blankenhorn case. Uh, granted, it was a trespass case. In that case, 2007 case, Mr. Blankenhorn did several things to not comply with the officers. He resisted. He pulled away. He threw his driver's license on the ground. So some degree of force was required in order to get him into custody because of the resistance. The distinguishing, uh, the attempt to distinguish Blankenhorn based on the fact that the underlying crimes for which Mr. Andrews was being sought were felonies, really comes down to whether or not he's a danger to the public. And I believe that the fact that he did not have a weapon, they knew that he did not have a weapon. The court made a findings that he did not have a weapon when he came through the courthouse metal detector back outside. 
and there were four, five officers out there waiting for him. We could have easily outnumbered him. He wasn't fleeing. He wasn't uh, evading, and he wasn't resisting. He did none of the things that Mr. Blankenhorn did when he simply came out of the courthouse and was suddenly ambushed by these two officers, Watford and Lippich. The, um, the, the court found that, and those findings are binding, that there was no weapon, and they knew that there was no weapon on Mr. Andrews at the time that he came out. So the, the conduct that he committed was even less violent or threatening than the conduct in Jackson. Now, uh, Mr. O cites to Jackson versus Bremerton, Again, this court just noted that that was a case in which the uh, the person was uh, was knocked down, but she was interfering with the arrest process. So the officers in that case did an act which was required because they had to make certain that they could affect the arrest without interference from a third party who was trying to interfere with that. And as the court noted on the um, on the Citrum versus Vote case, uh, that was a case in which the officer used his weapon as, I mean, his vehicle as a deadly weapon. The, uh, the court did find that there was uh, qualified immunity for the, the takedown, but that was after the officer used the weapon, used his vehicle as the weapon. So um, based on all the gram factors, uh, the severity of the crime. So these office, these detectives had been surveilling the female since two, and then watched her uh, proceed from the sportsman's manor at 2.52 p.m. They followed her as she got into the vehicle that Mr. Andrews was driving. Now, at the time that they were following, they didn't have any probable cause to believe that Mr. Andrews was the, the perpetrator of these crimes. But by the time that they got to the Henderson courthouse, the detective, the main lead detective, Kontratovich, did go back to his office, reviewed some video, and did some intelligence analysis on the vehicle and discovered that it was owned by Mr. Andrews' father. They, they did not, it's hard to believe they lost sight of him given that there's five detectives in different vehicles. He goes into a courthouse and simply walks with this other person into the courthouse through the metal detector, stays there for about 25 minutes, and then comes out. So as the court noted, those findings, they knew he did not have a weapon, he was not a threat. So they didn't try any less intrusive force to affect the arrest. And- Counsel, uh, can I interrupt for just a second? You mentioned this fact that opposing counsel has asserted several times, which is that the defendants say they lost sight of him for some period of time. How do we, you just said, you said that's hard to believe, but you don't have evidence that that's not true. I, I understand we're going to review the facts in light most favorable to your client, but if that's unrefuted testimony that they lost sight of him for a period of time, how do we factor that in, please? Well, Detective Kontratovich indicated in his report that they saw him go through the metal detector. And uh, in fact, uh, Detective Ebert stated he saw him go into the courthouse. So I believe that uh, a factual question that the court did not seem to focus on because the court noted, trial court Judge Mahan noted that Mr. Andrews came out of the courthouse and they knew he didn't, he was not armed. So even if they did lose sight of him, I don't think it's too important in the analysis because by the time Mr. Andrews exited the courthouse, they, he, he was seen going to the metal detector coming in, he left, they knew he didn't have a weapon. Uh, and, and at that time, they were trying to establish probable cause. So the detectives at the scene did not have clear information that Mr. Andrews was the perpetrator of those crimes. Just wanted to clarify that fact. So they just learned it literally moments before Mr. Andrews came out of the courthouse. Well, maybe minutes before. Um, in any event, I don't, I don't believe whether or not they lost sight of him, and I've probably superfluously threw that in is, 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 is that significant a point given the fact that they knew according to the trial court, Mr. Andrews did not have a weapon on him. So assuming that they lost sight of him as he parked his vehicle and then walked into the courthouse momentarily, 
he was in the courthouse for over 25 minutes. Then he comes out. And that's the significant point is that they knew he did not have a gun or any weapon because he went through a metal detector uh, on him at that time. So I believe that he was not a threat to the officers. And that's the main gram factor uh, of, the, of the gram factors. I think that's the most significant and the one that Blankenhorn uh, cites to. Uh, and as, as Judge, Judge uh, Forrest pointed out, just because somebody is alleged to have committed a felony does not give the officers carte blanche to use any degree of force that they want. Well, counsel, I mean, I mean, I mean, the flip side of that, of course, is that Graham itself makes the severity of, a, of the crime its own factor. Um, you know, uh, dangerousness or, um, yeah, the, the threat is its own factor separate from severity of the crime. So, so it's not... It's not unreasonable for opposing counsel to be arguing that Blankenhorn shouldn't control here because one of the key factors of Graham is different in that case than here. So why why doesn't he win on that? Well, because what 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 the severity of the crime goes to is whether or not the uh, suspect poses an immediate threat of harm to the officers. That's part of the analysis in terms of whether or not Mr. Andrews posed an immediate threat of harm. So the, the more serious the crime generally the more serious the threat of harm to the officers. And so I so just want to push back on that a little bit because there are two different factors there that I think get conflated perhaps. There's also a stronger interest, governmental interest in apprehending this individual because he's committed a more serious crime. And separately, if it's a more serious crime, um, there's um, a greater possibility of danger to the officers or to the public, isn't there? Are those two uh, different things. I, I, I would agree. I mean, if the more serious the crime, the more, generally speaking, the more uh, possible threat that that could result into the officers uh, in the process of arresting the person. But in this case, uh, th that was negated by the fact that they knew he did not have any weapon on him at all. And if you see the video, he simply walks, he's walk, he's standing at first, takes several steps. He's blindsided by the, by the gang tackle by two officers. So there was no possible way that this uh, crime that he was alleged to have committed that they just learned about and they haven't established probable cause until they do the arrest uh, isn't really the focus. The focus is whether there's a threat to the officer. And you admit that they had a right to arrest your client. I do. I do admit that. Was there an outstanding warrant for him? No, they did not have a warrant because they were in the process of uh, surveilling him or surveilling the female. And then they surveilled him as he, she got into the vehicle owned by Mr. Andrew's father. So they were trying to establish probable cause at the same time that that they occurred. So they did not have a warrant. They they did establish probable cause based on the information that the lead detective obtained when he went back to his uh, office and did some more uh, uh, investigation. Uh, Mr. Lippisch said he kind of fell over him. He didn't really exude any any force against your client. What about, what about that? How do you fit yeah. that in? Well, um, Judge Mahan determined that that's a factual dispute, uh, whether or not he fell, whether or not his momentum carried him onto Detective Watford, and then the two of them landed on top of Mr. Andrews. But we see him... Uh, running towards Mr. Andrews and Mr. Watford. So it appeared he was in the, in the process of trying to take Mr. Andrews into custody. Uh, the, the, the court, Judge Mann, determined that it was a, a disputed factual question, but it could be determined that that would fall in favor of the plaintiff because it may have not been an inadvertent fall. It may have been part of the process of tackling him and making sure that the degree of force was sufficient. And, for purposes of the clearly established law prong of qualified immunity, does that hang for you on Blankenhorn, or is there other law that gets you there as well? Well, I mean, the Santos case, obviously, is another case involving Santos versus Gates case. Um, there is no uh, felony case uh, right on point for, for this uh, gang tackling. I, I can see that there is no felony case right on point, but I agree that I do state that the, the Blankenhorn uh, suspect was more of a threat to the officers than Mr. Andrews was. So, uh, 
And I believe that the, really the analysis goes to the severity of the crime is whether or not he poses an, all the courts have determined that the main analysis and the most important point is whether or not he poses an immediate threat of safety to the officers. That's the number one priority. Does he pose an immediate threat of safety? He's got no weapon. They know he's got no weapon. Judge Mahan determined that he had no weapon in his findings, which cannot be refuted um, based on the fact that they just learned probable cause may have existed now. They had no right. I think it was clearly established just based on Graham and based on Blankenhorn and Santos that they had no right to use what they determined to be overwhelming force, uh, gang rushing him, knocking him down, causing the acetabellar fracture. The, um, uh, but yeah, there's no felony case right on point. But as you have noted, just because somebody is alleged to have committed a felony does not give them carte blanche to use any amount of force that they want to. Uh, but I believe that the main point of Graham is the threat to the officer, not just the severity of the crime. That's one part of the analysis in determining whether or not the, the suspect poses a threat to the safety of the officers, which is the main point in Graham. Um, So there has to be some necessity for using force. Graham states there has to be some necessity for using force. When you've got five officers out there and we see them in the video, they could have surrounded him. They could have used much less intrusive degree of force to affect the arrest. There was no requirement. They didn't even announce themselves. That's clear from viewing the video. And, and in the testimony of, of Lippich and others, they never announced themselves as police officers and said, you're under arrest. They simply gang rushed them. Um, the, um, counsel, opposing counsel argued that the, that was necessary or at least not unreasonable because they were in a crowded area. Um, can we see from the, I, we've watched the video of course, but right. it, does the record show us elsewhere um, the number of people that were in the vicinity or how many people he would have had to, Andrews would have had to pass to get from where he was to the front door? To leave well, the courthouse? Um, according to uh, uh, the detective that was assigned to follow uh, Mr. Andrews, the, the court room on that afternoon, the courthouse was empty virtually. Nobody was in the hall. It was not a crowded uh, courtroom in any way. It was uh, Friday afternoon, I believe at about three, 252, no, uh, three. I've got the time frame for the use of force report by Detective Watford. I, I, I apologize. I can uh, pull that uh, in one moment. That's okay. I, I've, I've looked at it and I think it, opposing counsel said it was going on four o'clock, but not quite yet. Right. right. I think 336 was the time that Detective Watford stated that the, the force was used. Uh, we don't see anybody outside the courthouse at that time, except for Andrews, the, the female he was with, and the five officers that were present waiting to, who were on plain clothes, waiting to affect the arrest. And then other uh, court personnel, security came out, but you don't see any civilians out there at all. So I believe that is not a factually accurate statement to say that it was a crowded area and they had to, to use uh, overwhelming force for the safety of the public. Nobody else is out there except for law enforcement at that time. With thank you for your argument, counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Out of time. So we'll hear from um, opposing counsel to wrap up. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I'm not sure how much time I have. I can't see the timer. You have about a minute um, and a half. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. I just wanted to just kind of wrap up my arguments here with this very important point. In looking at post Blankenhorn cases, um, where we're dealing with a situation where officers use a tackle to take someone into custody, we have two cases from 2016 um, that looked at all of the cases we're looking at here today, the Blankenhorn case, the Jackson case, and the Santos case. Each have different differing facts and having different outcomes of whether or not the use of a tackle is an unreasonable use of force. What I submit to this court is that 
when we're looking at these cases and given this body of law, you know, the law, it is very clear based on the two previous decisions post Blangenhorn that the law was not sufficiently clear, that the use of a tackle was not, un was unconstitutional and, and they granted qualified immunity. And this should be the case as well. And, and it really, we don't even have to take into the consideration the severity of the crime. But I will have this court note that in Satrum, he was uh, suspected of committing a fel felony uh, drug transaction. And on that basis, and even in that court, they felt that all the cases that were relied on here today and have discussed that the case law was not clearly established that using a tackle was, an, uh, was a deemed unconstitutional and therefore qualified immunity was granted. And the same should in this particular case. Um, since I have a little more time, uh, one thing I do want to uh, point actually, out. Is that actually, you don't. You're out of time. Oh, I'm sorry. Could you please, that's all right. Could you please wrap up? Oh, oh, that's all I would have to say, Your Honor. And based on that, uh, um, you know, I made my points and I submit it, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, counsel. Thank you both for your helpful arguments. We'll take that case under advisement.